Brucham Aboyim. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to our house. Thank you very much for attending. Um, <clears throat> we're about to begin the uh, second part of our lecture on kosher. We dealt with it last week. So, we had finished last week's My Thought with a description of the three animals that chew their cud uh, but do not have split hooves. Tonight, I'd like to continue my thought with a discussion about the only animal that has split hooves uh, but does not chew its cud, again, the pig. Man was originally created to be a vegetarian. However, after the flood, the nature of the world changed and so did the nature of man. That being the case, God now allowed man to eat meat. In general, the closer an animal's nature and disposition are to the vegetable kingdom, the less likely the eating of the meat of that animal will arouse within man animalistic tendencies. So therefore, those animals who have a, a more docile nature, those that are victims versus predators, are those animals that the Torah allows us to eat. In the dietary laws the Torah commands us to observe, we acknowledge that there is a qualitative difference between a Jew and a non-Jew. As the sage explained to the king of the Kuzari, he said that there are five categories of matter in creation. They are mineral, vegetable, animal, and man. And then the fifth category, which is the Jew. Imagine if a dog went to a garbage dump and ate his fill. After that, he quenched his thirst by drinking from a puddle of water that was on the side of the garbage. The dog would be fine. What if we ate the exact same food and then drank the same water? Well, it might be the last thing that we would eat or drink. It would probably most likely kill us. So too with a Jew and a Gentile. <clears throat> to say that turf and surf is not healthy uh, would be incorrect. After all, we observe many non-Jews who eat non-kosher foods daily, and they seem very healthy. So what we are referring to is a spiritual health, not necessarily physical. Rav Shimshul Afor Hirsch states that our body functions as a vehicle for our souls in this world. The soul occupies the body in an attempt to attain its desire for holiness and moral freedom. The more submissive the nature of the body is, the more likely it will submit to the desires of the soul in its quest for holiness. So therefore, foods that are members of the vegetable family of which all are permitted to be eaten are therefore the healthiest and most preferable food for man's sustenance. However, from a strictly religious point of view, these laws are what we call chukim, statutes, laws which are not predicated on any human logic. These chukim were given to us to teach us that whether we see a commandment as logical or not, we are still obligated to follow that which God in his Torah has commanded us to do. Our understanding should not be the deciding factor as to whether we accept or reject any mitzvah, since in the end, large or small, easy or difficult, all mitzvot are rotsan Hashem, the will of God. The Talmud in Shabbat 155 states that none is poorer than the dog and none is richer than the pig. What does that mean? So it's telling us that even though there is only one prohibition against eating pork, many Jews are careful about observing this law. No law is richer in its application. However, when it comes to slandering others, what we refer to as Lush and Hara, an action which is symbolized by the dog, as it states in the tractate of Sochem, one who slanders others deserves to be thrown to the dogs. In this case, ah, there are many prohibitions, <clears throat> and yet there is none poorer. People often violate these laws without ever thinking twice. Now the Kola Torah states that the Hebrew word chazir, pig, also means to return. This alludes to what we have been told by our sages, that in the final end of days, everything in the world including the pig, who returns to its original state of purity. The Orachim Akadr states that from the extra word who, which means he, in verse 7, we ascertain that at the time of the Mashiach, when Messiah comes, the pig will then chew its cud. 
The Torah Tamima explains that the statement really that does not really mean that the kid pig will actually become kosher, but rather alludes to the nation of Edom. And this is an allusion to descendants of Esau, who in the end will do tshuva. They will then, chazir, return the crown of kingship back to the children of Israel, where it truly belongs. The Orachim HaKadr states that the words in verse 7, which state, Fuhu geira lo yigor, and it does not chew its cud, that is an illusion that though the pig does not chew its cud now, but that in the future, he states, the pig will change its nature and then it will chew its cud. He questions as to why it is only the pig that will change its nature. Why don't we say the same for the camel, the rock badger, or, or the hare? And he answers that the difference between split hooves and chewing the cud is that the split hooves are connected to the externality of the animal that which is connected to the earth, whereas the chewing of the cud is connected to the internality of the animal, which purifies its food. So the pig, which has split hooves and does not chew its cud, is an allusion to a person who has spiritual potential, but does not use it properly. A Jew who has abandoned the path of godliness. Nonetheless, they are, always have the ability to return since they are not completely connected to the earth with all of its physical pleasures and selfishness. But someone who is constantly scrutinizing their deeds really overthinks everything. They may not be able to connect to spirituality since their feet are planted too firmly on the ground. We see the scenario played out many times with doctors and scientists. What we learn is that Hamaisa Hua Iker that an action is primary, the foot, and not chewing of the cud alluded to by thought. Now in the portion of Shemini, it continues with fish. Verse 9 states that any fish that has scales and fins is kosher and may be eaten. It seems strange that the Torah does not mention the names of any fish regardless of whether they are kosher or not. We have to wonder why. One reason given is that since they are hidden from view, Their names are not mentioned. Another reason mentioned is that it was Adam, first man who named all the animals and birds. He did not name the fish, and so they are not mentioned by name in the Torah. They are only referred to by their kosher signs. The Ramban, Nachmanites, states that those fish who have fins and scales generally live in the higher, cleaner waters. There they are sustained by air that enters into their bodies, This keeps their bodies warmer and makes them healthier. Fish live in water, and water is an allusion to Torah. This may be why they do not require ritual slaughtering to make them kosher. One may kill them in any fashion that they desire. In addition, their blood is permitted to be eaten, not like animals or birds. The Hebrew word mayan, water, has a gematria, a numerical value of 90, and as I've mentioned many times in the lectures, 9 is a number that alludes to truth. Sinapir is the Hebrew word for fins. This alludes to a Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar, who lives his life immersed in Mayim, Torah. The connection to fins is that the Torah scholar has both a desire and the ability to move from place to place in his quest to access new concepts in his Torah learning. The first commandment mentioned in the Torah was Peru or Vu, be fruitful and multiply. This command was meant not just physically, but spiritually as well, developing new ideas in Torah. Now the second set of the tablets that Moshe brought down from Mount Sinai were carved out of sapphire. The Hebrew word for sapphire is Sinapir, which has a gematria, a numerical value of 400 which alludes to the 400 years of slavery that was told to Abram Avinu, Abraham, our father, at the covenants of the parts, in the bris ben Hapsorim. The prophecy that his descendants would be slaves to Paro, Pharaoh in Egypt. Kaskeses, the Hebrew word, is the Hebrew word for scales, which alludes to the armor that protects those who study and commit themselves to learning Torah. It also functions as a vehicle to serve, 
and connect to God Almighty. In addition, it protects those truths that a Torah scholar has already acquired. Now, if a person studies the Torah with proper intent, it will protect not only your physical being, but it will also protect the Torah knowledge that you have acquired. If a person were to possess <clears throat> only fins but no scales, they may be able to enter into places where falsehood and evil reside, but with little protection to save them once they have entered. It is the fins that allow a fish to swim against the currents. Any fish that cannot swim against the current will die. So to a Jew must possess the moral fiber and strength of character to be able to navigate against the currents of society. They need to be protected by the scales, their spiritual armor, so to speak, so that they can overcome all the challenges that the secular world presents them with. In addition, they need to be able to weigh the merits and deficiencies of all their actions, as it stays in Pirkei Avot. Rebbe stated that one should weigh the benefits of a mitzvah, a good deed, over an avera, a sin, and the loss of an avera over a mitzvah. Ramachim of Breslov stated that the scales are also an allusion to the mitzvah of charity. This is one of the mitzvot which serves as a suit of armor that protects a person from all types of danger. Anyone who gives charity merits this type of garment. Last, the Torah lists those 24 birds that are not kosher. Again, the Ramban Nachmanizi states that any bird that attacks with its claws is automatically tome, unclean. The Talmud and the Tractate of Kulun states that these birds are not kosher because they are cruel. They hunt live prey and then they eat their prey while they are still alive. In addition, they use their claws to tear the flesh from their prey as they eat it again while they are still alive. The 24 non-kosher birds parallel the 24 books of the Torah referred to as the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, and Kasuma, the written law. Yet, even if a species of birds is not mentioned specifically in the Torah, we must verify that it has a tradition of being kosher before we can eat it. This is because the 24 non-kosher birds draw their roots from the written Torah, but the designation of kosher derives its status from the oral law. By honoring the traditions of our sages, all of our deeds will be considered kosher, again, based on Rav Nachman of Breslau. We are permitted to eat the egg of a kosher bird, but not the egg of a non-kosher bird. If an egg is completely oval or completely round, it was laid by an, a non-kosher bird. If one end is oval and the other end is round, it could have been laid by a kosher bird. If we are not certain that the leg was laid by a kosher bird, then we need to have the testimony of a trapper who has a tradition to ascertain that a kosher bird laid the egg before we can eat it, again based on the Oridea. The oval or sharp end of the egg alludes to the oral Torah. Since the Talmud is constructed of questions and sharp answers that clarify the issues that it discusses. The round end of an egg corresponds to the written Torah. It is an allusion to the Hebrew word for round, which is kad, which has a numerical value, a gematria of 24. Again, this number parallels to the 24 books of the written Torah. Again, as I mentioned, the Tanakh. In order for an egg to be kosher, it must have both an oval and a round end. This corresponds to both the written and the oral Torah. Rav Nachman states that the round egg, end of the egg, represents the concept of humility. The oval or sharp end represents boldness and brazenness. A kosher egg is a combination of both. This is an allusion to the Jew who acts humbly before those who are God-fearing and yet stands up boldly against those who try to obstruct his devotion to God Almighty. An egg that is round alludes to one who is humble before everyone, even those individuals who obstruct his relationship with God. An egg that is oval alludes to someone who possesses a holy boldness, a willingness to stand up against those who oppose 
his religious commitment. At the same time, he acts brazenly against those who are God-fearing. Since then, it is possible that a person could have impure humility and unholy brazenness. Therefore, the only way to ascertain whether an egg is kosher or not is by tradition. And just as we can conclude that a person is kosher by whether or not they follow Jewish tradition. Now, among the non-kosher birds that the Torah lists is the chasida, the stork. Rashi asks, why is this bird called chasida, which in Hebrew means kindness? Rashi answers, since it, since it acts with kindness towards its fellow beings in respect to food. So the Ger Rebbe asks, if the stork has such fine traits, why don't we eat it? He answers, his answer is very insightful. He states that a person can be kind to a fault, as when their acts of kindness are indiscriminate. Turning the other cheek is a Christian idea, not Jewish. Rav Trump says that the reason that the stork is unclean, is an unclean bird, is because it supports its species with food that it has stolen. This is not a true kindness. In reality, all it is, is glorified larceny. The ends do not justify the means, based on Antinian Latour. Torah also warns us not to eat insects and all wing-swarming things, such as flies, bees, or any unclean locusts. There is also a mention of the eight types of reptiles, such as weasels, mice, lizards, or geckos, that we are forbidden to eat. It doesn't mention the snake. The Talmud in Tractate Kulon states that the prohibition of a snake is derived from the verse in the portion of Shemini that states, all that crawl on their bellies. Based on this wording, we learn that only eating a snake is forbidden, not contact. So Rabbeinu Bechai says that it is logical for man to kill a snake, since they, they may be poisonous. However, if their carcasses would make a person impure, then one might be reluctant, hesitate to kill them. So the Torah does not extend the law of impurity to snakes to ensure that mankind would protect themselves based on the Talmud Now the laws of kosher in the portion of Rie end with the statement, you shall not cook a kid in its mother's milk. There are different reasons given for this prohibition. The Rashbam compares this to the prohibition of not slaughtering a mother cow in its calf on the same day or the law that requires a trapper to send away the mother bird before they can take the eggs from the nest. This teaches us that the Torah expects us to be civilized. Another reason given is that it would not be proper to mix something that was alive with something that is dead. The Ibn Ezra states that the law applies to all meat, but the kid is used as an example since that was a common animal at the time. The Haksab Yaqabala states that by, that by the use of the expression kid, gedi, the Torah is clarifying that only domesticated mammals, not birds or free-roaming animals, even pure ones, are covered by this legislation. The al says that both the mother and the milk are from the same source, yet God prohibited us from mixing the two together. So too, a Gentile and a Jew are both descended from Noah, Yet, they too cannot be mixed together. According to Kabbalah, milk is white, which alludes to chesed, kindness. Meat is red, which alludes to gevura, severity. Bringing these two opposite extremes together could have negative effect based on the Rebbe's Chumash. Now, though I have given reasons for many of the laws of Kashras, the bottom line is that it is all really Ratzon Hashem, the will of God, which of course is above any human reason or logic. So let us pray that we follow these laws properly and through our actions, let us help to herald in the coming of Mashiach Sakenu quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening and for attending. I uh, hope this has been informative and help you give some idea of the food that we eat and why we do what we do. Again, God should bless you with health and happiness and safety. And uh, Shabbat Shalom again. Thank you for listening.